everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Sydney Fortier. I am a research and innovation coordinator for the BCRC and I'll be your moderator this evening um, for the first of our nutrition series, No Longer a Mystery Feed Testing to Improve Herd Health and Feed Management. So we are very excited to put these webinars on for free through the Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. Um, so we ask if you have any questions that come up throughout the webinar to please submit them as we go into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we ask that you don't put them in the chat just so it's easier for us to go through them and moderate them during the live Q&A at the end of our session. Um, but we do encourage you to use the chat to um, share ideas or communicate with the other participants in the webinar. But just for specifically for Q&A questions for our speakers, please put those in that Q&A function. Um, the webinar is being recorded also, um, and the link to, to the recording will be sent out for all those who have registered, even those who are unable to attend live. So if you have somebody who wanted to attend but were unable to, but they are registered, not to worry, we'll be sending that recording out to them. Uh, so for those of you who have not subscribed to our blog yet, we highly encourage you to do so. If you are unaware, um, we share these posts to our website and you can subscribe to be the first to know whenever we post. Um, we share new research, time relevant information and updates on what the BCRC is up to. Um, so for example, our new website, which you, if you haven't gotten the chance to check it out, please do. Uh, nice new look and feel, better search function, um, but still all the information and resources that you know and love. Um, yeah. So there you can subscribe. Um, we also have a plethora of tools and calculators on our website. Um, so just one of the ones that I wanted to highlight on theme with our topic this evening. Um, so this is our tool for evaluating feed test results. So it evaluates the ability of a single feed to make basic nutritional requirements of different classes of cattle in different stages of production under normal circumstances. Um, so there is a four step process here. So the first step is to choose what class of cattle specifically you are feeding. So we have backgrounding replacements, mature cows and mature bulls. Um, once you've selected that, you either select the stage of production or if you are looking at a feed ingredient and evaluating that to feed to backgrounding cattle, then you will put in their average daily gain or target average daily gain. Um, this is followed by the weight of the cattle. Um, we have a list of the acceptable ranges or projected ranges that you would see depending on the class of cattle within um, the tool itself. Um, but we do encourage if you find yourself at like a mid range kind of um, weight, so like say 550 that you round down to 500, it just makes it a little bit more um, accurate and it's better to kind of over or underestimate than over. So this is what the calculator itself looks like. And so you'll enter your dry matter, TDN, crude protein, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium as it appears on your um, feed testing results. And it'll, the suitability of the feed will be indicated by color. So green indicates that the nutrient um, meets the required um, yeah, meets the adequate nutritional requirements. Um, yellow, it means it's within a range, either above or below the requirements by like certain factors. So it's not necessarily um, a huge concern, but it's something to kind of look at. And if you could balance it, then obviously do so. And then red means it's not meeting your nutrient requirements whatsoever. Um, so yeah, it's just a way to kind of make sense of feed test results and evaluate a single feed um, source as um, and see its value in your ration. Um, on this tool also, if you're interested, we have a tool for evaluating the economic value of feeds based on nutrient content. So it allows you to kind of compare and contrast certain feeds based on market price and nutrient value 
Um, yeah. So if you are interested in these tools, we highly encourage you to go onto our site and click on the interactive tools and calculator tab. So last year for the first time, we offered um, CE credits for RBTs as well as vets across the country. And we are very happy to be doing that again this year. So this webinar is available for CE credits if you are a vet or RBT across the country. Um, so if you are interested in getting your CE credit for that, please let us know. Um, we also have CE credits available um, for our previous webinars, so our backgrounding, record keeping, and Yonin's disease um, webinars. If you watch the video and get 70% or higher on the associated quiz, then you're eligible for that CE credit. So if you want any more information on this, please contact Dana Parker. Her email is on the screen right now and she can point you in the right direction. Um, in addition to this, we also have a tab on our website specifically for vet teams, just streamlining the information that vets and vet teams um, would probably be, find helpful or of interest and making sure it's in one nice, easy location. We also have a newsletter if you're interested in subscribing to that one as well. Um, yeah, and if you don't wanna to subscribe to anything, but you wanna keep in touch with us and see what we're up to, we highly encourage you guys to follow us on social media. But without further ado, I am going to announce the stars of the show tonight. Um, so I'm going to invite Bree to start sharing her screen, but we are going to hear from Tara a little bit later. So Dr. Brianna Kelm was raised on a mixed farm where she continues to farm with her husband and son near Duval, Saskatchewan. Brianna worked for a few years before attending the University of Saskatchewan, where she obtained a BSA, a Master of Science, and a PhD that she actually received not too long ago this year um, from the Department of Animal and Poultry Science. Throughout this time, she worked in various industry roles involved in agronomy, livestock, and extension. Her PhD program focused on the inclusion of bloat-free legumes into existing pasture stands to improve productivity. This project used a systems approach to evaluate the effects of sod seeded bloat free legumes, specifically sandfoin and sizer milk vetch, on pasture productivity, animal performance, rumen fermentation, greenhouse gas emissions, and system economics. Recently, Brianna was selected as the new Beef Industry Integrated Forage Management and Utilization Chair for the University of Saskatchewan, where she holds a joint appointment in the departments of plant sciences and animal and poultry science. So please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Kelm. Thank you, Sydney. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we hear you great. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, like Sydney said, I just recently stepped into this role. So this is like my first official gig. So this is exciting. Um, and so I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight about feed testing to improve your herd health and uh, feed management. So we'll get right into it here. Let's see if this will change. Sorry, I'm just gonna move a few things around. So the outline today um, that I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna talk a bit about the why of feed testing. I think that's important to always, you know, kind of understand why it's important to do it and why we might be wanting to do that on our operation. And then, kind of the details around the what, when, how, where of feed testing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what makes good feed and little beef cow, uh, cattle nutrition, and then just some opportunities for feed testing to enhance your operation. So just starting out, you know, why, why is it important to feed test? Well, we know that, I mean, this is no, you know, nothing new earth shattering information here. The winter feeding period in Canada is 200 days per year. And, you know, that you say it quickly and, and it doesn't sound like much really, but, you know, we're dealing with very um, harsh conditions. And so, you know, we're feeding these beef cows during real inclement weather, minus 30 and minus 40 degree temperatures and lots of snow. And so, um, you know, it, that of course comes with, with challenges. 
when we think about um, forage prices, of course, again, nothing probably earth shattering or surprising to anyone of you who was um, feeding cattle in the last few years. But um, when we look at Saskatchewan forage prices, um, this information comes from Kathy Larson, Canfax, um, the Canadian Cost of Production Analysis. Um, we can see that when we look at Saskatchewan specifically, alfalfa and grass hay nearly doubled uh, in 2021 versus 2022. Um, straw prices were up 2.4 uh, times what they were previous in the previous year. We look specifically at Alberta, um, those prices, the hay price increased roughly 20% in 2021. And then in so far year to date, 2022 numbers, um, we're looking upwards of 40% increase over 2021. 2021 average feed cost was up 27%. So roughly $124 per cow. Again, that came from uh, the Canadian cost of production analysis versus 2020. And there was a bit of a difference um, between, or a bit, there was a, a large difference between Western Canada, um, which was up 47% and Eastern Canada, which was only up about 5%. So total costs uh, for the, the past uh, year in that 2021 year were $1,529 per cow total cost of production. And that's made up of $936 uh, of st strictly cash costs and then 158 of depreciation and then 435 of uh, opportunity costs. So um, even just the, you know, the, just the cash cost and the depreciation costs, you're um, close to $1,100 per animal. <clears throat> when we look at the, uh, this is a five-year average of uh, cow-calf costs, um, just kind of split out to understand where those costs are going. And you can see that when we look at feed and bedding, it's roughly 40% of the total cost of production. And then our pasture costs add another 28%. So, um, you know, we're close to 70% of, of um, cost of production going into winter feeding and summer feeding. So really what you feed and how you feed it are the biggest costs for the cow herd. And so I think that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight is just some of the things that we can do and think about um, to try and make the most of that feed that we are, uh, that we do have on farm. So some of the questions, you know, um, I thought I'd kind of go through just, you know, a few things in terms of kind of um, splitting this out. Um, like I said in the outline, kind of the the who, the what, the when, the why. Um, and so when we think about what we would feed test, um, pretty, you know, we have lots of options um, and uh, really, you know, anything that we're going to be feeding to these animals can be can be tested. So a lot of times we'll test our stored forages. So this could be hay, silage or straw. Uh, it could be byproducts and supplements that we're feeding. So we might be testing our grains. We could be um, testing dry distillers grains, pulse starches, oil seed meal, uh, screenings if you have access to them. You might want to test your pellets and just see, you know, what quality they are, uh, maybe what type of protein level they have. Um, and then, um, you know, those are kind of what you're going to be feeding in the winter time. but you might be also wanting to take a look at your summer pasture. So you might be um, testing some of that pasture during the summertime, or you might test it, you could test it in the fall. If you're doing like an extended fall grazing, you could test swaths, you can test um, your standing crop. And then one thing I'm not going to talk about here, but, you know, is just as important really is you know, um, and goes into making a ration or, or you know, putting together um, a feed ration for these animals is water. And so that's something that is equally as uh, important to test. So a lot of questions um, that I might get, you know, would be, or when, when is the right time to feed test? And um, really, honestly, any time uh, is a great time to feed test and it's really going to be better than nothing. Um, something like a silage you know or something that's a bit wetter wet um, grains um, or silages they can be vacuum sealed and often um, you know an easy way to do that is to vacuum seal them in a food preserver and then just throw them in your freezer and then you know the next time that you um, have a chance to send them off for analysis they're they're ready to go you might uh, look to test before um, you're feeding or open, right when you're going to open up that silage pit, specifically with silages, you know, that's a good time to do it. 
Um, and with silages in particular, that feed test is going to also give us uh, a fermentation profile. And so that's just going to allow us to understand better, you know, how did that um, silage uh, how well is it stored? How well did it ferment? And although you may not be able to do anything with it right now, it'll allow you to take a look at your practices in terms of how you put that feed up and then possibly make some changes for the following year. You might be looking to feed test before you purchase or before you sell feed. And like Sydney said, there's lots of um, online calculators that are available so that you can, um, you know, place an economic value onto that, those uh, feeds that you might be looking to purchase or sell. You might be looking to uh, test that feed during feed out. So partway through exam, partway through, you know, um, a silage pit, you might want to do another test and just see how much has changed or if there has been any change. Those are kind of all proactive reasons to test your feed. Um, there are some other, you know, reasons and that would be kind of more reactive when we're trying to figure out, you know, is there an issue going on? And so um, you might suspect that certain feeds have um, if issues um, such as nitrates or mycotoxins. Um, and so that might be a reason that you're gonna wanna do that test. And the other, um, again, kind of more reactive um, reason to test or, or when you would decide to test is if you're trying to determine a production issue. So you had poor, possibly poor reproduction or poor gains on, on calves. Um, and uh, so then you're gonna go back and you're gonna say, okay, how, you know, was it the feed? Let's do a feed test. And so um, just some real kind of practical um, points here, you know, on really just how do we actually get that feed test and what's the best way to, to, to take a sample. We really, the biggest thing is we want to make sure we have a representative sample. And so, you know, we want to make sure that, that sample really represents the field that you took it from or the pile that you took it from. So when we think about um, taking cores, um, you're going to take those cores, multiple cores um, from either bales or silage. Um, you're going to mix them really well, and then you're going to place that sample or you know a part of that sample into a large Ziploc bag. Again, if it's a silage, um, something like a food saver is a really great way. You know, just vacuum seal all the air out of it and throw it in the freezer. Um, it won't spoil on you, and then you know that it can. Um, it's ready to to send away when, when you have time to do it. With bales, you know, ideally we want to take probably 15 or 20 cores or 15 or 20 bales uh, per field. And with silage, um, you're probably going to want to take three to five cores. And those are larger cores. Those typically those silage probes are about a, you know, one meter in length. Um, and uh, again, vacuum seal with a food preserver and then they're easy um, to send away. I thought I would put in, um, often we get questions about, you know, where do I purchase a forage probe? Um, these are two uh, places here, Star Quality Sample uh, Samplers out of Alberta. Um, uh, has a large selection of sampling uh, probes, different types, um, and Dairy One out of New York is another great option. So then the next question, you know, we've, we've decided we're going to take the sample, we've taken it, and now where do we send it? And this is, you know, I think this can be somewhat of a challenge or be can maybe confusing to producers. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I think um, Tara is going to touch on this in her presentation a bit. But um, <clears throat> I just thought I would put a few up here. This by no means is like an all-inclusive list, but you can see you've got a lot of options available um, within Canada and within the United States. So um, again, I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but I thought I would put that up there. You can take a picture um, of that if you need to, and um, it just allows you to kind of have an idea of where you could send those samples. Okay, so then the next question really is now what do I do? So I've got, you know, I've got my results back. Now what what do I do with them? And I think that that also becomes a challenge for a lot of producers. Um, you know, is you've got this data, you've got this information, but, you know, what do you do with it? Um, there are ration balancing programs out there. So um, you've got uh, cow bites, um, like Sydney mentioned, um, the BCRC feed testing calculator. Again, that's just for a single feed ingredient. And I think, you know, as we start to... Um, um, 
and deal with more feed ingredients or feed ingredients that are um, maybe one-off type feeds, um, you're going to want to have you know, some type of a program that can help put all that information together for you and make it quite easy um, to understand. Um, NDS is another program, although it's um, a bit, um, you know, more, more intensive and more in-depth. You also have, um, you know, reach out to your provincial regional specialists and extension specialists. Um, I believe, you know, they likely all have access to these types of programs and, and um, can help um, put together uh, a ration for you. Um, of course, um, there's, you know, lots of nutritionists, um, feed companies and industry specialists that all, um, you know, I'm sure would be happy to work with you and put, uh, put a ration together for you if you are dealing with multiple feeds or feeds that you're not used to feeding or you haven't fed before. And then veterinarians is the final group um, that I would suggest um, to reach out um, and, uh, you know, they might be able to help put something together for you. So a lot of times, you know, um, you take a look at this um, sample and you say, well, is this good feed? Like, you know, how do I know how to interpret this? And is this something that, um, you know, I want to feed to my animals? And it's kind of a loaded question because um, there's really no straightforward answer. Um, it really depends on, you know, there's a lot of questions. Um, you know, if you were to bring this um, sample to me, I'd probably ask quite a few questions before I could respond to that. And, you know, the first would be, what is this animal? Uh, you know, what, which animal is this going to? So, you know, are we, are you feeding, you know, 600 pound calves that have a high protein um, requirement or are they 900 pound calves and their protein requirement is slightly lower? Um, you know, or are they replacement heifers versus, uh, you know, bred mature cows? Um, you know, based on this quality, you know, then the next question really is, you know, how much of it do we, do we want to feed? Um, do we have enough of it or are we, you know, is it a small portion and we don't have a lot of access um, to this feed and we're going to need to kind of ration it? Um, and then the next question is, you know, can we improve the quality of it? Is there something that we can do in terms of processing, whether it's grains or, um, or, or even, you know, haze that'll help improve um, the quality? And then finally, again, are we feeding a single feed ingredient or are we going to be blending this with other feed ingredients? And I think, you know, that's where it really becomes um, a bit more in depth and a bit more challenging is when we start to look at uh, blending feeds and, and, um, and I mean, that's where, you know, there can be a lot of, um, uh, you know, Econ there's economics to that and there's ways to kind of, you know, save some dollars if we're able to blend some low quality feeds with some high quality feeds. But again, we've got to do it properly and make sure that we're meeting a uh, nutritional requirement of these animals. So really, we can assess the forages based on just that one nutrient. For example, like if we were just to look at the crude protein, it really doesn't tell us a lot just by itself. We kind of have to look at um, a few other aspects of that feed in order to understand what you know how we would use it and so I think that's what we're going to kind of get into here a little bit. So the next question really is you know you know what makes good feed? You know we have this crop that we've grown potentially an annual cereal for example or maybe it's a hay crop and, you know, then we're going to store it. And here I've got pictures of, you know, corn and a silage pit, but really um, what I'm going to talk about is um, relevant for dry hay production or, or any type of, um, you know, s stored feed. And so there's a lot that goes into it when we're talking about the, the feed analysis, really what that, that's just giving us a, a one piece of the puzzle. So that's the chemical analysis. Um, it's really the nutritive value. Um, but feed quality and forage quality um, encompasses quite a bit more than just that chemical analysis. So we have, you know, that chemical analysis, um, but then we also have the physical part of it. So how is it processed? How is it fed out? How is it stored? Um, all of those are going to impact, you know, whether or not it's, you know, quote unquote, good feed and whether or not um, it, it um, you know, gives you the production results that you're looking for. And then finally, there's that social aspect of how those animals are managed. And that really can also play into, um, you know, you can have good feed, um, really great feed and 
possibly not get the production results that you're um, looking for because of some some of the social dynamics or how they're managed. Um, so again, those there's kind of three components that really go into whether or not um, that feed is good and whether or not it's going to give you the production results that you're looking for. So top uh, six influencers of forage quality. This is greatest to least, and I think um, this is always an interesting slide. I, uh, you know, I, I like sharing this one because um, a lot of times, um, you know, if I was in a room full of producers, I would ask, you know, what do you think is the top um, influencer of forage quality, and um, you know, it, there might be weather, it might be um, the type of species, but um, the absolute number one um, influencer of forage quality is the maturity at harvest. So again, um, this goes into kind of something that um, really is within the producer's control in terms of managing forage quality on their farm. The day that they turn on, the um, you know the key to their their harvester, that's the day that they're locking in the quality of that forage. So after that, we have crop species. So you can think of things like, you know, legumes versus grasses or um, barley versus oats. And we have harvest and storage. So again, something that's very much within the, um, you know, within your control as a producer. So, you know, how are you harvesting it? And then how are you storing it? And are you able to maintain that high quality, you know, high valued crop that you, you know, harvested out of the field? Are you able to maintain it? Uh, through the winter, you know, as you're storing it. And then after that comes the environment, soil fertility, and the variety that you grow. So it's kind of an interesting list. This is out of uh, Penn State. So we think about a feed test and um, about feeding cattle, you know, what nutrients are we concerned with? Um, so we're definitely, we'll talk about energy, we're concerned with energy, we're concerned with protein, uh, minerals, vitamins, and then water. And those really are kind of the fundamentals to, you know, nutrition and, you know, what we look at um, in terms of, uh, you know, feeding, feeding cows. And so when we think about, um, I've got this, you know, live eggs, live minimum, you guys have probably heard of this, but um, we think about production, it really is, um, you know, related to that, the, the, the lowest minimum factor there. And so um, if energy, for example, is, is um, not meeting requirement, you're not going to fix, you know, an energy shortage, you know, with um, mineral supplementation or protein supplementation. Um, and so um, it's really important to kind of have all of those um, nutrients uh, in balance and meeting uh, requirement of those animals to gain full potential uh, of your production. <clears throat> so when we look at formulating cattle diets, we always uh, express those requirements on a dry matter basis. Energy and protein are the major nutrients um, that we're, we're trying to meet when we look at a feed test and we look at, um, at uh, formulating a cattle or a beef cow diet. So really the ingredients that we require energy, protein, and then usually some type of dilution ingredient. And so when you think about your feeds on farm, um, that's really how you can think of them. When you do a feed test, you can think, you know, is this one my energy source or is it my protein source or is it my dilution ingredient, like maybe like a straw. And so we want really high, you know, energy, um, nice um, level of protein, and then something to kind of blend and again, I'm, I'm talking more so when we're talking about like a total mixed ration, not just feeding, um, you know, um, one type of ingredient, but when we're mixing them together. So forage is that essential ingredient um, and the rest, you know, really is um, and, and forage is going to make up the majority of their diet. And the rest is just some sort of a concentrate that you might use to balance energy and protein needs. And then, of course, you're going to check for the, the minerals and vitamins within that, that ration. I thought I would talk about dry matter intake. Um, dry matter, um, it, it, that'll be, you'll see that on your feed test, and that's an important um, 
very important number to look at um, because you know animals are going to have a dry matter um, intake requirement and you can see that um, we look at typical forage dry matters you know your silages are probably going to range somewhere between 30 and 50 percent dry matter so quite a bit of moisture of course in those silages your haze are probably 85 to 90 percent dry matter uh, your grains are are 90 percent dry matter and why is this important? You know, as we start to see more producers feeding silages um, or feeds that maybe are um, off one-off feeds, like last year, you know, um, there was producers feeding, uh, you know, different feeds that they've never fed before. And some of those feeds may have been very high moisture. And so um, understanding dry matter intake is very important to make sure that you're um, meeting the animal's dry matter intake. So if you know, um, look at this 1,500-pound uh, cow here. Uh, we can say that, you know, she'll eat roughly 2.3% of her body weight in dry matter intake. And so that's 34.5 pounds of dry matter um, required. So if our ration, if our blended, once we blend all our feeds together, if, if that ration is 65% dry matter, we go, you know, 34.5 times, oh, I think I've got my numbers here uh, backwards, uh, should be 65. But um, you'll roughly get the point here that, um, you know, we're looking at roughly in the 50s in terms of uh, as fed uh, pounds um, of dry matter. Now, if we switch this to 45% dry matter, 34.5 times 0.45, that gives us 76 pounds of as fed. And so you can see the difference here in terms of, you know, the total weight that you're going to be feeding those animals. And so a lot of times um, that dry matter can change. It can change in the silage pile. Um, but I think it's just an important thing to note um, when you're, as you're feeding those animals, their intakes may change. So you may be feeding them um, one week and then the next week um, you're thinking, well, jeepers, they're not eating as much as the week before. And it could be that the dry matters um, have changed, you know, a slightly on that feed. And so they're just getting more dry matter and less moisture in that feed. An easy way to check your dry matters at home. You can purchase, uh, this is just a, a heater that you can just flip on its end and it'll just sit there and blow hot air, get a flour sifter and put your uh, forage and whatever feeds you're wanting to test in there and it can sit on top of the heater. And then you just need a, a food scale. And so this is a cheap and easy and quick way to check your dry matters on uh, feeds that you have on farm if you are questioning it. You don't need to send a sample away just to get a dry matter. So cattle eat to meet their energy needs. We're gonna talk about a little bit about um, requirements here, um, energy, and that's, this is an important one. So they're eating to meet their energy need. They're not eating to meet, you know, a mineral need or, or a protein requirement. So a mature beef cow is going to eat 1.75 to 2.5% of her body weight and dry matter. And it's going to be a little bit less near calving. So it's important to know because you're going to want to possibly, because she's just unable to eat as much, you're going to want to make uh, that uh, diet maybe a little bit more energy dense um, as she gets nearer to calving. It's going to be impacted by forage quality. So things like neutral detergent fiber, that's another uh, a variable that you're going to find on your feed test. And um, really, um, this is really a, a, you know, a good indi indicator of uh, animal intake, you know, how much of that feed is she going to be able to eat? We start to get on the really high level, um, you know, you're going to see, um, you know, over definitely over 70%, you're going to start to see restrictions in uh, feed intake or in feed intake. Um, and so um, NDF values, uh, something that's impacted by plant maturity. Um, so your grass haze, um, a lot of times are going to be, you know, somewhere in that 50 to 55%, um, whereas something like a cereal silage, you might uh, see it uh, have a little bit of a lower NDF value, so maybe 45 to 50%. 
And the next uh, uh, fiber that um, you'll see is ADF, which is acid detergent fiber. And that one really is the least uh, digestible portion of the plant. And so it really is a reflection of digestibility of that, of that forage. And so, uh, let, you know, for example, you know, your legumes typically um, will have less ADF. So they'll be a little bit uh, more digestible than uh, grass uh, would have. And essentially, at the end of the day, you know, if we have better quality feeds, you're going to have higher intake. So that is important for, you know, animals, especially um, that are growing. So calves um, or uh, animals that just can't see, you know, they are unable to eat um, the, the feed um, and ha have the uh, forage um, that they require. So again, things like a mature cow that's close to calving or a replacement heifer um, that just has a, a lower amount of intake. So energy, again, this one's a really important one. This one is um, the nutrient that's required in the largest amounts. It's usually the most limiting nutrient in rations, and uh, it is the most costly to supply. So when, when you're thinking about, you know, putting up feed, you really need to be thinking about, again, you know, where am I deriving energy from for these, for these cattle, which are my, my feed sources that are an energy source. So what you're going to see on the feed test is you're going to see um, total digestible nutrients and that's just a really um, nice number to kind of give you an idea of, of where that feed sits in terms of energy. And so uh, kind of rules of thumb for the mature beef cow is, you know, to keep this in mind is 55, 60, 65 percent. And so 55 is a mature beef cow um, to maintain body condition. She's going to need, you know, 60 percent when she gets into late pregnancy and then 65 percent when she's lactating. Another energy value that you might see on the feed test is, is net energy. And you'll see either net energy maintenance or net energy gain. And they're usually um, reported in megacals per pound or megacals per kilo. And so again, this is just, um, this is off. This is a great uh, feed testing uh, fact sheet from BCRC. You can look it up. And um, and uh, it has a nice little chart here in terms of what that animal needs in terms of uh, May cows per day for uh, net energy or pounds uh, of uh, total digestible nutrients. So what are some of the factors affecting beef cow energy requirements? Her age definitely can be a factor, her body weight, Level of production, so is she lactating? Again, um, if she's lactating, she's gonna need quite a bit more energy um, than you know, if she's in early trimester. Is she a replacement heifer and you know, she's still trying to put on bone and, and uh, muscle growth herself, plus uh, you know, raise that, that calf inside her, definitely going to need more energy. You know, what are her body fat stores like? Is she a thin cow? You know, they're probably going to need up to, you know, 30 or 40 percent more energy than a cow that's in good shape. So how did she come off of that summer pasture? Um, you know, do you need to supply her with a bit more energy to get her up to uh, where her body fat stores should be? What's her hair and hide thickness like? And then again, environment, um, you know, cold stress, we could be looking at 10 to 30% increase in intake. And so um, again, just they're going to eat to meet those energy requirements that they have during that cold snap. So protein factors affecting protein requirements, again, age of the animal, uh, Again, a calf that's 600 pounds actually has a higher protein requirement than a calf that's, you know, 1,000 pounds. So age, um, body weight um, definitely um, can play a factor. And then again, level of production, are they milking? What type of growth rate are you asking out of them? You know, if they're calves and you're, you know, wanting two pounds of a gain a day, that's different than, um, you know, uh, two and a half pounds. You know, are they are they pregnant is another good question. So with crude protein, uh, and the kind of the rules of thumb or the numbers to kind of keep in in your mind uh, for the mature beef cow is uh, seven, nine, eleven. So seven percent in mid pregnancy, nine percent in late pregnancy, and eleven percent in during lactation. 
Finally, uh, some of the things, you know, once you get to the point where you're um, kind of, you've got your energy and your protein um, in balance, you're going to look at minerals and vitamins. So minerals and vitamins are going to change based on, you know, whether or not you're winter feeding um, or are they out on, you know, fresh um, pasture with some legumes in it. Um, you know, what plant species, again, grass versus legumes, of course, we've got differences there in terms of calcium and phosphorus. Um, the way that you're managing those forages, uh, stage of plant growth and when they were harvested. Soil types can definitely impact the amount of minerals and vitamins that are in your, um, that are in those forages. Um, Selenium is a great example of this one. You know, we know that um, certain areas um, accumulate selenium in the soil and then that's accumulated in um, those forages. And, and I mean, it can become, uh, to levels that are that are almost toxic. So um, definitely soil type can can play a role. The weather uh, can play a role. And then the final thing again is water quality and what those animals have access to. So again, um, you know, when when you're making up uh, and thinking about, you know, your your ration and feed testing, um, you know, what water those animals have access to while they're consuming that feed is going to be an important factor that needs to be, uh, you know, calculated and, and inputted into the calculation um, when you're looking especially at minerals and vitamins. So each year is going to have different challenges. And so, um, you know, some are going to be visible and some not. And I think, you know, when we think about um, feed testing, um, a lot of times we you know, um, think about um, kind of being reactive um, sometimes, but, um, you know, we can also be proactive about it. So if we know that we've, you know, potentially got an issue, um, that's a great time to, um, you know, to get that feed tested and uh, you may not always be able to visually see it. So things like drought, um, which we've experienced in the past, uh, early frost, um, both of those can, you know, increase nitrate levels um, in feeds. Moisture during flowering. Um, so depending on the type of feed, um, you know, you can have issues with ergot, um, which can be uh, um, associated with moisture during a flower, the flowering event of those plants. Um, so I spoke about nitrates, but, you know, field molds, mycotoxins, um, ergot, fusarium, all of those um, definitely um, can, can cause issues. Um, things like polycrop blends, um, you know, uh, depending on the blend, um, they might have higher levels of sulfur. And so um, just a, another good, um, just check, you know, check the box and make sure that they've, um, that they've got at it, you know, not, not uh, toxic levels. And, and I mean, um, you know, the thing about a lot of these, these, um, issues is um, typically for the most part they can be fed out so they might be um, just fed to um, depending on on the problem you know you can dilute them um, and and not have any production issues or maybe feed them to animals that um, you know are not um, in reproductive stage something like that so I mean I think there's ways around it but the biggest thing is just whether or not you you're um, aware of it um, and you know how much of, of that issue is in that feed. And I think that really, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, low quality forages, grains, byproducts, a lot of those, um, those are real opportunities um, for the beef cow producer and they can be very economical depending on, you know, um, what, what you have available or what your neighbors maybe have available. If you think about, you know, hailed out crops or something like that, um, they can be economical, but they can also pose a risk. And so, um, you know, I know over the last few years um, with the drought, um, there was lots of producers that were harvesting, um, you know, really anything and everything that they could get their hands on, um, you know, which was fantastic for them. Um, and then it, it really was a matter of just uh, making sure that we had proper feedback tests on them um, and creating blends that they could work with. So it can be done and it can be worked through um, as long as you have the information in front of you. So really about, um, you know, preventing problems before they start. I think an opportunity um, really as well, aside from, the, you know, the nutritional components of feed testing, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in terms of inventory management. I think sometimes, you know, we feed animals um, 
you know, at different um, stages throughout the year, different production cycles, uh, we might actually be overfeeding certain nutrients. And so I think there's an opportunity to um, sort of um, experience, you know, maybe uh, feed sparing or um, allow for certain feeds to be only fed to certain production groups at certain times and not overfeed some of those nutrients. So if we know that certain feeds, you know, are very high in protein, those uh, feeds might be able to be spared and, you know, fed to uh, groups of animals that need a bit higher uh, protein, like young calves or, um, you know, animals that are lactating. We need to know, in, you know, in order to work with inventory management, um, you know, we really need to know how much feed is available. So we need to, you know, of course, have accurate weights um, of feed inventory. Um, and that's going to be important, especially again on feed out as well. We need to know how many groups need to be fed. And then when should you feed those um, certain ingredients? So again, I, I just spoke to this, but, you know, high protein really could go to some of those younger calves and you may not need to feed those higher protein um, uh, forages as those calves get older and get larger. And so um, that's definitely an area where, you know, you might be able to save some of that feed and feed them uh, something that's a bit lower protein as they age. Uh, again, lactation diets um, are, are going to be different um, than, you know, an animal that's a dry, dry cow. And then replacement heifer diets, of course, again, um, depending on what stage of production they're in, um, you know, we might be able to kind of, um, you know, feed them uh, or, or feed some of our, our forages to them um, just to make them stretch and go a little bit further. And I think being able to look at a whole winter um, and plan out, you know, what diets are you feeding for how long um, and how much of the feed, you know, really can, you know, possibly take some stress off of, you know, um, kind of running through some of those feeds um, and, and then being left short in the spring. And then this was uh, this is the one of my last slides here, but really the opportunity with the one-off feeds, um, which I would call, you know, um, I think we experienced that the last um, few years again. Lots of producers were, um, you know, trying to bail up, you know, sort of whatever they could get their hands on. And each year is going to present you with a, you know, an opportunity to feed something that maybe you haven't fed before. Um, and so. Um, you know, having that feed test on those feeds and then understanding how to incorporate it into a diet um, can really um, possibly uh, change the economics of your winter feeding. So things like canola silage, kosha, um, different screenings that are available depending on where you're located, different meals uh, that are available, DDGs. So again, just um, depending on the year and the time of year, you might have access to some of these sort of one-off feeds that you maybe have never fed before or you wouldn't feed on a regular basis, but they can be incorporated to try and reduce cost. So really what's next and what's kind of the next um, thing, you know, I think, you know, if you're interested in feed testing, um, you know, assess your feed resources, you know, what type of tests um, do you require? Uh, you know, do you have grains on farm that you want to test versus silages versus dry haze? Um, so, you know, what have you got and, and how much of each and, and, you know, what type of test is required is sort of the next question. And then, you know, do you have the right tools on hand to take that representative feed sample? Do you need to reach out? Um, you know, do you have a, a forage probe? Um, are you going to go purchase a forage probe? Or, you know, do you possibly, can you, you know, borrow one from your a local regional office, for example? And then really, what are your goals? You know, who... You know, and, and then along with that, you know, what are your goals for feed testing and who can you work with to utilize and interpret or interpret those results? I think that's really the the, the key um, point here is the interpretation and the utilization of those results. Um, it's, you know, it's fairly easy to get that feed test. Um, and then I think, you know, you have to understand how you're going to use it. Is there any problems that you want to avoid? Do you have any problem feeds that you're worried about? And, you know, those really should, you know, maybe you want those first on the list for the ones that you're going to feed test. 
And then what are your feeding options? So what is, what's realistic for your operation and what type of a plan can you execute? You know, um, if you don't have the ability and, and you really have no intention of feeding, um, you know, multiple ingredients at a time, um, then that's fine. And I think, you know, you, you know, that's realistic for your operation. So, you know, maybe you just need one, one or two feed tests on a couple types of feed and a single ingredient calculator like the one that's on BCR. Um, so I think, you know, there's multiple ways to, to feed cattle. And I think it really comes down to, um, you know, just understanding and, and what, what you have available on your operation and then what you can execute, because there's no sense in putting together a plan that you can't execute. Um, so do you have access to, you know, are you going to be bale feeding, uh, feeding whole bales? Um, are you processing those bales? Are you doing a total mixed ration? I mean, a lot of those um, then... Um, kind of depending on your answers there really can um, change um, your next steps as well. Um, this is really my um, second last slide and I'm just going to put a plug in. Um, Kathy Larson and myself and a few other researchers um, have a survey coming out this fall, the Western Canadian Feed Testing and Ration Balancing Survey. And we're just trying to understand, um, you know, what are some barriers, what are some challenges, opportunities, uh, you know, limitations to feed testing um, for producers in Western Canada. And so please keep a, a lookout for that. Um, it'll be coming out um, here this winter and uh, there's a $25 honorarium for completing that survey. And with that, um, I will, th this is my last slide and um, I'll pass it back over to Sydney, I guess. And I think we're going to do questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bree. That was awesome. Yeah, and yes, just to confirm with you, we will be doing questions at the end. I see that a couple have come through. So just another reminder that if any questions have come up or you would like, um, or any questions come up as our next speaker presents, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll definitely get to them um, at the end of the presentation. Um, Brie, if I could get you to stop sharing your screen and then we can get Tara to share hers. And while we're doing that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Tara Mulhern Davidson. Um, Tara ranches with her husband, Ross, and four young children in Southwest Saskatchewan near Pontix. They run Lonesome Dove Ranch, a large commercial and purebred Gilbay op cow calf operation that they started in 2005. They raise feeder calves and replacement heifers, market freezer beef, and work alongside Ross's parents at D Davidson Gilvey to co-host an annual yearling bull sale. Tara obtained her BSA from the University of Saskatchewan with a major in animal science and a minor in rangeland resources. She has worked in the provincial, federal, and nonprofit sectors as a rangeland specialist. She currently works as a beef and forage extension consultant for the Beef Cattle Research Council and enjoys freelance writing for several publications. She rambles about livestock, parenting, and the prairie on her blog, A Little Bit Western. Tara loves the diversity of ranch life, whether it's teaching her children to identify invasive weeds at highway speeds, her never-ending quest to make the perfect hay bale, or making connections within the livestock and forage sector. She's an active social media storyteller and enjoys sharing a little insight into her family's day-to-day -day adventures. So please join me in welcoming Tara. Right on, I think you guys can see my screen okay? Yep, looks great. Awesome, good. Uh, well, I, for some reason my notes aren't showing up, so I'm really gonna wing this one here. But um, yeah, I'll just open up here by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about feed testing. Um, I do work for BCRC, but I am totally doing this on my own perspective. So I'll be representing our own ranch, Lonesome Dove Ranch here, um, and my insight, I guess, into how we've used feed testing on our farm. And I promise you, uh, Bree and I did not actually collaborate ahead of time on our titles, um, but we both are, I guess, uh, like-minded because we're hitting the what, how, where, and why of feed testing. Um, and yeah, we just open up the shot, I guess, with a few uh, shots of all four seasons on our ranch uh, where we're located. Um, I'm just not able to advance here. 
I'm just going to hold on for a second here. I might be in the wrong window. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, hmm. Are you able to advance my slides, Sydney? Um, I don't think I could do it from this end, but if you try clicking on it, like when you're sharing it, click on it and then try to advance, sometimes that works. All right, we'll try this version actually here. All right, okay, there we go, good. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm just gonna talk a bit about our operation. Uh, we run quite a few, several hundred cow-calf pairs. Um, about a quarter of our herd is purebred galvey and uh, three quarters are commercial galvey cattle. So um, we raise and are feeding, I guess, from this context, um, we feed a variety of different classes of cattle, whether it is um, developing commercial replacement heifers, uh, developing our purebred yearling bulls, which we sell in our annual sale each year with my in-laws, um, you know, mature cows, uh, we've got bred heifers, and then we also have a fat pen. We usually have a few cattle that we're fattening up for my freezer beef sales. Um, so we, we do have a, a few different enterprises, I guess. Um, as far as where we're located, um, we are uh, west of Assiniboia and east of Shaunavon and north of Valmarie and south of Swift Current. So I don't know if that, those town names mean anything to anybody, but we are in the southwest part of Saskatchewan. That's just a shot of our home quarter there. Uh, so of course, uh, Brianna made some great points um, that certainly uh, grazing, uh, you know, grazing and, and feed a, a account for a huge proportion of the cost of raising a cow-calf animal, or cow-calf pair rather, and uh, grazing for us is certainly the gold standard when it comes to economics. We prefer to graze uh, as long as we can into the season. Uh, if possible, sometimes we'll supplement with like a malt sprout pellet or something like that uh, to get more grazing days out in the winter time. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's certainly a winter feeding period on our farm, and some winters are pretty extreme. And we're also, um, I guess, since 2017, like many regions across Western Canada, we've been dealing with a severe moisture deficit, especially the last two years. So um, we might not have grass, uh, that, that tame grass uh, shot here above uh, with the green grass uh, is, is pre-2017, but it's a fun reminder that the grass will be green, has been green, it will be green again. Uh, we also rely a lot on native prairie grasslands as well, um, so that's the landscape in the bottom there. Um, so grazing is really important to us. However, for our winter feeding period, we also um, do use a lot of annual cropland and silage. So um, there was a time we, we relied mostly on green feed. Uh, we relied a lot on, on hay and dry hay. And then uh, there was kind of a turning point and we, um, we shifted towards silage. Um, in 2013. So um, we've silaged a variety of different crops, um, whether it's, um, we've actually silaged uh, like grass alfalfa blends, we've had sweet clover, we've, uh, we use a lot of winter cereals actually on our farm. Uh, we've used a lot of uh, polycrops, so mixing cereals with forage peas, that's been a great blend for us. Um, kind of when we seed a crop in the spring, we're not certain is it going to be diverted to feed? Is it going to be diverted to silage? Or maybe even we'll cash, cash crop it um, or combine it for seed for next year, that sort of thing. Um, so feed testing. Um, we've always feed tested some form or another on our farm. Uh, growing up though, feed testing I was really um, doing it more from a, his, um, from a forage selling standpoint. So um, I grew up on a mixed farming operation. Uh, so we sold a lot of forage, a lot of hay. That was uh, one of the main enterprises that we had on our farm. So that's me and my dad out there in the hay field and a mixed grain operation as well. So I'd go along with dad. We'd always be out sampling forage um, as a, a selling feature, I guess. So establishing the crude protein value, establishing the TDN um, so that dad could sell his hay into different, um, different markets. So we exported a lot of hay into the Montana. Um, he was an early pioneer of, of uh, the hay auction concept. So um, yeah, that was kind of my background, I guess, in forage testing it was more about establishing a value. Um, and just a quick note, here um, when you're buying or selling forage it's really important to have a weight uh, have a bale weight if that's what you're selling or buying um, you're essentially importing nutrients onto your farm so it's really important to know um, 
how much you're you're bringing onto your farm. So sometimes I see debates on on social media about what's the point to just sell it by the bale. Well, do that, but only if you know how much your bale weighs. So it's it's just kind of an important um, important feature for for buying and selling. So and the forage market is kind of the wild west. I mean, you know, anything goes. Some things, um, like Bree mentioned in her earlier presentation, certainly the values of things have have spiked dramatically in the last few years. So, um, you know, what's one person's trash is kind of another person's treasure. But the only way you really know is what you have is if you feed test and if you know how much it weighs. So I just want to I like to use props during presentations. This is the Mulhern Heritage uh, forage sampling device. So I'm lucky to have that uh, because, yeah, it can be hard to find the forage sampling uh, devices when you want them and when you need them. Uh, so here's just kind of a shot of, uh, of some of our cattle out on pasture. Um, so over the years, um, like I said, we were really using a lot of green feed, a lot of hay. Um, this actual, this forage test is um, from some, it's from 2015 when we came across an opportunity feed. There was a hail durham crop, so we raked and baled that and wanted to know kind of what we had. Um, so we've always done forage analysis. Um, quite often I would um, either send it away through our veterinarian or send it away through a feed company. Um, then towards the end, I really got just so I sent it direct to a feed lab myself and they'd send us back the samples or the analysis. Um, and that worked really well. Um, for a lot of years, I'd worked with the extension specialists in our area, our regional services. And if you're from a province or region, that you're still lucky enough to have extension services, I really encourage you to use them and to reach out to them because those folks are there, they have the knowledge, they're there to help, and they certainly have helped us over the years for sure. Uh, so in 2013, um, things took a turn and we, and Bernadette entered my life. Um, Bernadette, it's not so much who is she, but more what is she? Uh, so my husband, it was his birthday, he bought himself a total mixed ration feed truck and that uh, rolled into my yard on June 19th. And uh, I, it was kind of the era before smartphones. So she's here on the, this is the only picture I have of hers from within the cab. Um, but really it did open up our, um, it did open up our way, our eyes, I guess, of a different way of feeding. So up until then, we'd never had a total mixed ration or, or had the ability to mix different ingredients together or feed silage if we were to have silage. But after Bernadette rolled in, burning a lot of oil, um, we did have that opportunity. So um, over the years, we've we've adapted our, our feeding model. Um, we did start that that summer, actually, we had the opportunity to purchase the standing barley crops. So we had that silaged. And that was the first year we started um, started silaging. Uh, and I will say, I honestly learned how to silage on Twitter. Uh, we, we had no idea how, what we were doing. Uh, we just had an idea and knew we could make it work. So, um, you know, having discussions with people that had experience and, you know, kind of hearing the good, the bad and the ugly was, you know, we just dived right in. And then over the years, we've adapted our feeding trucks. Um, we've had a few different feed trucks. Um, we had a farm aid mixer wagon. Uh, right now, I actually don't have a photo of our existing or current feed wagon, but it's a Cadillac. Um, and I just like the one feed truck we had came with this really lovely sticker that said, if you value your life as much as I value this truck, don't mess with it, which I always got kind of a kick out of. Uh, so yeah, just, I guess, silage, um, like I mentioned, we've silaged a variety of different crops. Um, we've always used custom silage operators and, um, you know, we've used a variety of different outfits and we've always had great luck with whoever we work with. Um, there's definitely timing um, constraints, you know, knowing when they're going to be in the area, um, whether there's breakdowns, how far ahead to cut in front of the silage outfit, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, just keeping the lines of communication open has been really important for us. And we've been able to silage winter cereal crops, which are typically ready for us as early as the end of June, uh, through to weed crops. Um, we've, we've silaged weeds before if we've had them in the area and they're finishing some other work. So, um, cereal crops, I think, are the most forgiving and the kind of the best bang for your buck as far as getting good tonnage or for us in our area anyway. Um, and then, yeah, we've also um, been able to have some green feed bales and certainly opportunity feeds. Um, we feed a lot of kosher. We 
Detroit area, not just in, in the last couple of years. So um, hail, like I mentioned, those hail Durham bales really got us through one winter. Um, finding straw is a real challenge in our region. So that's probably one of our biggest limiting ingredients, but um, you know, we just kind of have kind of a, <laughs> a saying in our house that uh, it'll make a cow patty and it will, you know, um, but I guess it depends how economical you can make that patty and how um, how cheap you can get things done, but still not sacrifice the health of your animals or the performance, especially of your younger animals that you're still growing out. Uh, so yeah, that's just kind of a shot of our um, of our sweet clover that one year that we had. And, and you know, every silage crop is different. Um, a sweet clover silage, not just nutrient wise, but I mean, it packs really dense. Um, it's, it's just a lot different than other crops. Um, I'd say uh, sweet clover is pretty easy to silage for us that year. Um, so, like I said, cereal crops are really forgiving. Um, I think the hardest thing we ever tried to do was some haylage, some alfalfa. It worked out okay, but it wasn't the best. Um, and in our area, we have a lot of evapotranspiration, a lot of wind. Um, things can dry up real quick. So it's really important to try and manage that um, moisture balance. And I have always felt pretty strongly about using inoculant. I think that gives you that buffer, I guess, when, when you're not sure uh, timing wise or moisture wise, um, you know, I think it's really important for us anyway to inoculate our, our silage. And then that's just a shot of a feed bunk that um, we've developed uh, that we can feed two different class or yeah, I guess the same, ration to two different pens of cattle at a time. It's got some slabs upright and then these uh, drill stem boxes that we can put the feed right into with the, the feed wagon. And I just want to mention too, like the, this by no means is a suggestion that everybody needs a TMR wagon. Um, you know, there's like 60,000 beef producers in Canada. So there's 60,000 different ways of feeding cattle. So do what works for you for sure. I'm just, you know, speaking to my experience and, um, you know, uh, Dr. Callan mentioned some great tips, like just do what works for you. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, do what works for your operation, keep it practical. So 2021 hit, um, you know, like most people, I think it was just kind of, we'd already been dry for so long, um, just dealing with the heat and the wind and the dwindling stock water was, you know, extra exhausting. Um, and I think we realized early on that we were going to have to get really creative if we wanted to avoid having to dump a lot of cows. Um, certainly we called harder than we normally would. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we really didn't want to have to have this mass, mass dump of cows if we could at all help it. Um, you'll see in our area and on our ranch in particular, we're, we're quite spread out. We've got cattle spread, you know, kind of across five RMs and in different piecemeals. You know, we rent a lot of pastures. We have, you know, up to a section in lots of places, but other places, you know, we might only be dealing with 80 acres of pasture here or a half section there. So in a lot of cases, we ran out of stock water well before we ran out of grass, um, which really prompted us to think about how we're going to feed these cattle and what are we going to feed these cattle. So just a few more <laughs> inspirational shots of fire, you know, and, and it doesn't matter where you're located. Um, you know, beef producers have been dealing with fires. They've been dealing with floods. They've been dealing with drought. You know, we're resilient. We always figure out a way. Um, it just becomes a, a matter of how to figure out what we're going to do and how to solve the problems we have. Then entered 2022. So we did have some more moisture uh, in the early spring of 2022. So we did get some silage crops. We actually did have a nice silage harvest. Um, we are going into the winter with some abundant silage and it's cereal silage, which is awesome. Um, but we certainly ran into grasshopper issues, um, gophers, you know, we stockpiled a lot of grass and, you know, between the gophers and the grasshoppers were not, not sitting real good going into the fall for, for pasture or next spring either for this, for that matter. And same thing with stock water again. So just trying to figure out what resources do we have? How do we use them the best way we can and the most economical way we can? Uh, so like I mentioned, 2021, it became pretty clear we were not going to be able to feed normally. Um, there was no feed to be had. Um, it wasn't a matter of, you know, not wanting to pay for feed. There just simply wasn't any feed. Um, we found that, you know, later on in the season, we had neighbors that would lose, you know, feed stocks to fire or, or have a fire in their, their tub grinding pit, for example. You know, replacing that feed was 
impossible. You just couldn't get it. So um, early on, my husband uh, reached out to a local crop farmer and, you know, he was watching his canola crop and he noticed it wasn't it was in various stages of flowering and it didn't look like it was going to, you know, really make much of a crop. Um, so it was a good classic example of a partnership between a, a cattle producer and a crop farmer. Um, you know, we were able to pay him a fair value for his, his crop, but he wasn't in the position of having to go over that area with those acres with a combine and we silaged canola um, and we just kept silaging. <laughs> uh, and that was basically what, what was the bulk of our entire, um, what we built our ration on for, you know, feeding all of the classes of cattle that we, we did last winter. Um, and, you know, again, similar to how I learned how to silage the, in the first place in 2013, I reached out to Twitter, I reached out to researchers, producers. One of the first people I phoned was, was Dr. Callan and said, you know, how, what, why, you know, what are we doing here? How do we, this is our opportunity. How do we make the best of this situation and, and make this opportunity value added proposition? So um, we did learn quite a few things about feeding canola. Um, you know, especially making it, uh, allowing it to wilt a long time. So you're not, it doesn't get mushy. So we did um, swath about a whole day ahead of the chopper, which was kind of a little bit weird in our area. You typically don't swath a whole lot, you know, more than what the chopper is behind you. Uh, in this case, we, you know, we're, we're swathing sections before the whole chopper got through it. Um, chop length was also important. And then again, um, you know, someone had, I might've even been uh, Bree who suggested don't, uh, leave just uh, canola on the top of the pile. Um, you want to maybe cover it with a thin layer of cereal silage if you can to prevent the the stems, the thick stems from poking holes in through it. So again, you know, people were really generous with their information. I was phoning up producers that I've never met in person before, or, you know, I, I definitely phone people I did know well too, and I won't name names, but it was really motivating and really encouraging to hear them, you know, share their ideas. And if nothing else, they said, you'll make it work. I, I know you will. And, and that was really helpful. That was, you know, kind of the, the mental boost I think we needed at that time. Uh, so yeah, this year we, um, you know, had a decent amount of cereal silage and some mixed pea, uh, peas, triticale and uh, barley silage, which was really nice. Um, some fall rye silage as well. And yeah, fast forward to where we're sampling now. Um, that's my son up on top of the silage pit there with another Brianna who um, <laughs> who uh, works with Beef Smart and she's our nutritionist now. And um, yeah, so so I guess maybe I forgot to mention, but this is kind of critical. So in 2021, once we started, you know, using these really novel feeds on our farm. I realized this is over my head and I want to pull in some other expertise here. So we went with a nutritionist and honestly, it was probably, it was a huge relief. It was one of the best decisions we've made on our farm in the last couple of years. And it's, it's come, you know, full circle. We've, we've got a lot of benefit from, from working with them. And this isn't, again, this isn't a pitch for you guys to all who's watching to go out and get a nutritionist, but the benefits that we found on our farm, whether they're helping us source inoculant. Um, I talked to Brianna really closely. Brianna sent his, um, as far as our harvest window for fall rye, um, you know, knowing when we could and when we should harvest fall rye is, is helpful as well. Um, and, you know, just the benefits have been really, really good on our farm, I guess. Um, another thing too, with, with canola, um, Dr. Callan mentioned, you know, issues with sulfates. Um, we have issues already in our water with sulfates. So we knew we had to be really careful, um, use as much canola as we could because that was what we had, but still not, um, you know, cause issues, cause production issues or, or get outside of a safe zone as far as feeding, feeding too much sulfates to our cattle. Um, and same thing with nitrates as well, um, with kochia, that can be an issue, oxalates, things like that. So um, just being able to have the expertise of someone who's seen a lot of different ideas, seen a lot of things, knows, you know, some of the more subtle um, values of having, uh, you know, of, of the intricacies of how minerals work and how things are tied up by certain ingredients. Um, that was really helpful. 
And then, yeah, I always learn something new. This was kind of my tip this year, um, just marking off your silage pits. So every winter, you know, we have <laughs> my husband and I have these complex discussions. Like, I don't know, have we used half our silage yet? I don't know. Well, Brianna suggested, why don't you just mark it off with a, you know, a spray paint? So we did and we marked it off in, in quarters and halves. And it was the easiest uh, solution to that little problem. I feel ridiculous for not thinking of it earlier. But, you know, every time we have a discussion with someone, we always learn something so it, it's been good i'll just try and play this little video here um, it's just a time lapse of us uh covering our pit last year so we put our pit um, on above ground um, it's well drained area i mean <laughs> what isn't well drained in southwest saskatchewan right now but um, we are exceptionally well drained here um, and it's easy access to all our other ingredients um, for uh for for mixing in the tmr and um, yeah, we just we just cover it with uh, plastic and put uh, dirt around the edges or, or even manure actually just to pull down um, pull down the plastic tight and that's how we do it. So when should you test? So again, you know, we use a TMR wagon on our farm, but I'm not saying everybody that's going to work for everybody. If you're bale grazing, especially if you're buying your bales, you know, you're importing those nutrients onto your farm. So you should know how, you know, what you're buying. You should know the value of it for sure. And then it'll help you set up your bale pods for bale grazing. You know, how many head are going to be in an area. Um, you can set your fence up based on, on what your feed test results are. Swath grazing, certainly um, stockpile grazing. I have done forage analysis on native prairie before. I've done forage analysis on um, stockpiled grazing, you know, back when that was a thing before the hoppers ate it all. Um, just, you know, because if you have, you know, breed, bread heifers, for example, on, on real dry grass, we're looking at wanting to possibly supplement them, even if it's with a tub of some sort. You don't know what to supplement them with if you don't have have that information in front of you. Uh, corn grazing, we've done a little bit of corn grazing. I think if we were more serious about it, um, we would do more acre, or we're grazing more acres, we'd certainly um, consider uh, forage testing for that for sure. Um, and opportunity feeds, again, I mentioned kosher, um, and you know, there are a lot of opportunity feeds out there, I think, especially um, working with our crop farming counterparts, if we can clean up kosher patches, um, there's a lot of herbicide resistant issues, um, as far as weeds go, if you can get in there, get some, some stuff cut, baled, um, you know, it cleans up their weeds, it also provides you some forage of some sort, but there's a risk with it, you know, you do have to feed test to make sure you're not dealing with nitrates or any issues like that. And again, water issues. And again, we're very fortunate in Saskatchewan. We have excellent regional um, livestock specialists test water for us. I mean, I test our water very regularly. If that were out of pocket my expense, it would be you know over $1,000 a year just on water testing. So we're very, very fortunate to have um, water testing for stock water in Saskatchewan in our in our regional livestock offices. So if you are in an area that has that, please use it. I think it's really important to let people know how important or how valuable it is. Again, nitrate concerns, mycotoxins, things like that. Um, those are all all concerns um, that can be addressed through feed testing. So I am pretty active on social media. Um, you know, most of what I talked about, I've probably shared at one point or another on any one of these social media channels. Um, I've got a great silage TikTok right now, if you guys are into that. So that's um, uh, all our, our handles are up, up there right now. So if anyone feels like they want to check out um, what's going on with us, I think our, our social media channels are a pretty good way to see what's going on and reach out. And certainly if you guys have questions too after the webinar or, or you know, you think of something a day or two later, um, please feel free to reach out there. And then, yeah, um, I guess I'll just open it up for questions and just, you know, this is a shot of our kids. They're active, active helpers on our farm and uh, they've enjoyed um, learning about forage sampling. They go out with a family forage sampling device and they'll head out and take some samples and um yeah it's just it's a fun fun season of our life to figure out problem solving together thanks tara that was awesome yeah um, I'm going to invite our speakers to turn their cameras on. We have a few questions that have floated in, and so I'm going to go ahead and jump into them now. But I, again, thank you both so much for those great presentations. That was 
absolutely perfect and really highlighted exactly why feed testing is important and kind of the the important parts to if I want to get into it, how do I make that happen? So that was great. Um, on that note, though, I will reiterate that um, a th something that Bree and Tara both mentioned was kind of reaching out to your community and really utilizing the provincial um, experts and specialists that are available. And so highly encourage you guys to do that if you are interested in feed testing. And if you don't know where to look or where to start, for sure reach out to us at BCRC because we could definitely point you in the right direction. Um, so yeah, on that note, we're gonna jump into questions. Um, so the first question um, is for Brie and it's just a clarification of what makes up opportunity costs. Yeah, that's a good question. I should have clarified that in the presentation. So the opportunity costs are um, <clears throat> costs like um, associated with, you know, if you were to do something else with that land. So um, I think, you know, in those numbers, you know, the two really important ones are your cash costs and your depreciation. Um, I've talked with Kathy Larson about this a lot. I think she's actually on the presentation, so maybe she has a better uh, answer than me. But um, you know, um, those two are the are the two main ones. The cash costs, of course, like those are your cash costs. You have to absolutely cover that, and then your depreciation cost. Um, <clears throat> and so I think the values for that um, slide were close to eleven hundred dollars, and the opportunity co costs, of course, add quite a bit onto that. Um, and again, that is just sort of um, a look at, um, you know, if you were to do something else with that land, um, uh, what is that value or what could you, what, what it's a missed opportunity, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I might just add to um, the BCRC has a valuation for feed um, calculator on their interactive tools, and it's basically and actually they were just re-promoted it through their B for Bin uh, recent web post on their blog, um, and it basically helps you decide you know is it worth more um, as a cash crop is it or what possibly would it be valued as a cash crop so when it came to figuring out a value for this canola last year um, we really had to look at what it would cost the guy to combine it and what it was valued at um, you know based on rough estimated yields and to be honest the price of canola spiked as we were doing the agreement you know it went up to $30 a bushel so I mean it didn't take very many bushels in order to secure a decent uh, amount of, of value out of that so I think that kind of relates a little bit to opportunity cost too but really trying to figure out a, a fair price for those commodities. <laughs> Kathy just messaged me here um, and said um, that um, that value also includes unpaid labor. So it's really, um, you know, your money is tied up in the land and the assets, um, and it could be earning um, interest as an investment elsewhere, but also there is that unpaid labor that's also included in there. Um, so that's kind of the value of your time into the operation. So again, like that number is a bit of a, um, um, it, it, like it's, it's an additional number, but, um, it's important to recognize, um, but, but, you know, from a cash, um, kind of paying the bills value, I guess, um, really it's the cash cost and the depreciation and then like, yeah, your unpaid labor and all of that is included in the opportunity cost. <clears throat> Thank you both. That was great. Um, I also, with mention of the, the feed valuation calculator, I popped that in the chat in case anyone was interested in checking that out. Um, our next question is, instead of taking cores, can one mix five tons in the mixer and sample from there, or can that cause errors? Um, yeah, it just... Um... <clears throat> It kind of depends, I guess, again, on your goals. Um, so there's two ways to look at that. If you were trying to evaluate if you have like, 
um, you know, it, are you having issues with your mixer? Um, you know, then you could mix up a ration um, and test that ration and see if it kind of compares with the ration that was designed. Um, and, and, you know, that would give you an idea there. As far as taking a feed sample, um, you know, I, I guess you could take it from the mixer, but um, ideally, you know, if you have the whole idea is to get a really well rounded sample from across you know that stockpile so if it's a if you have you know 200 bales um in a row you would want to sample you know tw 20 or or 30 of those bales um but you would you wouldn't want to take them all from like the front of the line you know you want to take them for a, a, a range um, of bales. So like, you know, if you're pulling silage out of your silage pile um, or you're feeding bales in your mixer and maybe it's only from one area of the field, it might not be a true representative sample. But um, again, you know, if you're trying to kind of diagnose an issue and maybe you're wondering if it's a feed mixer issue um, or if, you know, a mixer efficiency issue, then you could go to the mixer and take a sample out of there after you've placed your ingredients in. Great, thanks Bree. Um, the next question that we have here are, since feed prices are fluctuating a lot recently, have any producers or researchers tried seasonal mixed crop forages, cereal legume, either hay or silage system? Yeah, for um, sure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tara. I say this year we underseeded everything to um, sweet clover, so I'm um, hoping that we would get like a cover crop for next year. Uh, and we also did seed a lot of um, forage peas mixed with uh, triticale and barley as well. So that is a preferred way to um, for us to silage for sure. We really appreciate that blend. Um, just, uh, I guess, a note, our, our cover crops were coming really well. Um, and then again, we had some grasshopper issues. So um, anything that was green is, is kind of susceptible to their damage. So um, yeah, when possible, it is, it is good to, to see the blend though. It's worked well in our farm. Um, yeah, and I would just add that um, I think with, you know, um, polycrops and those um, kind of, um, crop, uh, different feeding practices coming um, or becoming more prevalent. Um, there has been, um, or there is, you know, quite a few researchers that are starting to um, look at them, um, you know, and try to put some numbers, I guess, to, you know, there's obviously lots of producers that are having good experiences with them. And so I think there's some researchers that are trying to, you know, again, put, put the numbers to, you know, kind of um, quantify what producers are seeing on farm. Um, so I'm sure that in the next few years, you'll start to see lots of um, fact sheets and um, research um, come out um, from those programs. Thank you both. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, how do you feed sample on standing forage to be winter grazed? Would it be best to gather a sample in late October before heavy snow? Um, the closer to time of grazing should be more accurate. Is that the best? Yeah, that one's a kind of a tough one. Again, in that a lot of times what I'll tell guys is I mean, something is better than nothing. So, you know, if you're gonna try and wait until right before you feed it and then you don't get a sample, you know, you're better off to go in maybe a little bit earlier. Once that plant has, you know, kind of died off, like in the case of like a standing corn or a cereal silage that's been cut or something like that, um, you know, you may not see a whole lot of change, um, you know, so if you can sample it kind of before um, the, you know, you get too much snow out there that, uh, and that's easier for you, um, and you know you're going to do it, and you know you're going to, you know, get that sample taken, then that's the, what I would say is, that's the best time to do it. Um, you know, if you feel like you can, you know, wait until three weeks before you plan to feed it, and you know you're going to get out there and get a sample, um, that's fine too. But I think, um, yeah, whatever is kind of manageable for you you know again once that plant has somewhat you know once it's senesced and died off and um you know um i don't know that you're going to see a huge amount of change 
or a drastic change enough to kind of um, make the difference between, you know, waiting for another three weeks to take that sample. Thanks, Bree. Um, Tara, do you have anything to add to that one or should we move on? Um, yeah, I guess the one time, uh, you know, I've done it in the last few years, I guess, just a couple times, I've tried to take the sample from where, an, um, from the ground up, where an animal could actually bite it too. So not taking like the entire, you know, ground to, to mature height, um, you know, sample, just cutting it where an animal would naturally graze it from. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, Brie hit the nail on the head as far as you know, it's not going to change a lot. Um, it's just more or less kind of establishing a benchmark of what it might be. And I guess I should have mentioned that too, for on-farm feed testing. Um, you know, some years I honestly didn't do a lot with the analysis, um, which isn't ideal, but I mean, real life, you know, we've got, you know, busy household and things like that. But the one thing I really appreciate about having years of forage analysis is I can look back on the data. So I've been able to establish on farm nutritional benchmarks for us. You know, I know how our intercrop worked this year silage, I can compare it to how it worked, you know, in, in 2016, for example. So um, that's been a, a benefit to having regular forage sampling on our farm. That actually leads perfectly into our next question. Um, so are there recommendations for testing forages periodically throughout the year to monitor potential changes in quality? So just timing of um, feed testing. Any thoughts? Um, I'm not sure if I like, um, am aware of any like hard and fast rules in terms of, you know, recommendations. I mean, in terms of your stored forages, um, typically, you know, getting those, you know, once, once you've got those bales or that silage put, you know, in your pit, um, you know, and, you know, the silage has had time to ferment, um, you know, then it's really, um, you know, get that sample taken, um, and that likely should be good, you know, for that winter um, feeding, unless, you, you know, you're running into, um, you know, issues, you know, something like, um, you know, a, something like your silages, they may change, um, or you may see differences depending on, um, you know, where you are in that pit, um, how big the pit is, you know, towards the ends of the pile or the pit, you might um, see some differences in terms of, you know, quality, but, um, but yeah, I, so I mean, through the winter, you know, generally, I would say your stored forages, you know, if you take them in the fall, um, you know, that that's probably good, um, you know, to get you through kind of for what you're going to be needing it for for the winter. Um, you know, if, if it's older forages or they've sat, you know, you may want to do a recheck just to see if anything's changed depending on how they've been stored. Um, so that would be something, to, you know, if it's, if you've got a, a pile of silage or, you know, bales that have been sitting for a while. Um, and then as far as like, um, you know, through the summer, um, the, you know, if you are wanting to do pastures, I mean, th those will change, you know, because that plant is, is actively growing. So, um, you know, depending on kind of how you're utilizing the pasture might change. Um, if you're going to put animals into that field, um, you know, you might want to take a sample before they go in, um, and then maybe they're not coming back for another 60 days or something and, you know, or, or you know, 45 or 50 days, and then maybe you'll take another sample. But the big one is like the winter um, stored winter forages. And, and with those ones, I think generally speaking, you know, one sample in the fall is probably an, enough. Yeah. Thanks, Bring. Anything to add, Tara? Um, I guess I could just add that um, for things like straw, for example, where we're kind of getting 30 here or 90 there, um, if we're looking at including it in our ration, um, our, our nutritionist is really good about saying like, hey, it's probably not practical to sample 30 bales here, 90 bales there, you know, so, um, you know, I, I, for a major feed, definitely, I I'd, I'd encourage you to sample it, but for something small that you know, small batches here or there, it's probably not practical. I um, mean, just thinking back to the question about how, whether you should actually sample your total mixed ration as a, a feed sample, I think the benefit of, of working with a nutritionist is 
to find out what goes in that total mixed ration. So if you, you know, are sampling your individual ingredients and, and a thing I didn't really mention is fine tuning your mineral, um, getting that amount of mineral into your cows every day, that same consistent amount that is huge for our farm anyway, where we do deal with stock water issues. Um, we want to know what our ingredients have so we can come up with a, you know, piece together the puzzle, I guess, as far as what goes into that TMR. Great, thank you. Um, this is our last question. Um, and seeing the time, this is going to be our last question for sure. Um, have you ever had a problem with hemorrhaging from feeding sweet clover? Um, for us, uh, we were concerned about it, but um, we tried to use that forage on, um, you know, developing animals instead of, um, so we used it for replacement quite a bit. And for our cows leading up to calving, but not right before calving. Uh, but we did do, um, we really were careful to test for mycotoxins um, for that forage. And actually, yeah, we, we really, that was before we had a nutritionist. I'm sure I'd love to know the conversation we'd have now a little bit more and uh, just give us the confidence to know how much we could include up to a certain point. But, you know, it was definitely on our radar. Um, but you know, talking to other producers, they, they just cautioned, you know, don't, don't feed it too close to calving, but uh, don't be scared to use it either. And it was a great forage for us that year. I, you know, think fondly back on, <laughs> on the swath rolling out of the swath or that was, you know, that's a, a happy place. It's nice to have that forage. And um, you know, we certainly haven't seen that in the last few years. So it's, uh, well, we make use of what we find. Dr. Kelm, do you have anything to add? No, I think, um, like, I, I, yeah, I just want to say, I think Tara, um, you know, brought up a lot of good points. I mean, I think the whole, and I, and I tried to get that across in my presentation as well. I mean, I think there's many ways to feed cattle in Western Canada um, or in Canada. <laughs> and so I think, you know, it's really about, you know, finding, you know, what are the opportunities that you have available, whether it's, you know, sweet clover or canola silage or, you know, what have you. And then, um, you know, and then um, just figuring out a way to feed them. And so, um, again, it's not like you have to have a TMR mixer. If you're doing bale grazing, like Tara made a good point there, um, you know, you, it might, um, a feed test might allow you to um, understand maybe where you're going to place some of those bales versus others. You know, if they're going to be getting closer to uh, pregnancy on the back part of the field, maybe you have certain bales that you want to put there instead. So I think, um, I don't think it needs to be too complicated. I don't think it needs, or, or expensive. You know, I don't think you need to go out and buy yourself a TMR mixer um, by any means. Um, but if you I guess my point is that if you do have access to those, um, you know, I think then, you know, hopefully um, you can just, um, you know, make the most of it um, and make the most of some of those opportunity feeds. And if you don't, um, you know, again, hopefully, um, you know, that feed test can help you make the most, um, you know, efficient use of the feed that you have available on your farm.